All right, thank you. Uh, so Tim asked me to come and speak on this topic of four years of humanitarian intervention in Syria. Uh, the particular approach I'll be taking is based on my background in American foreign policy and international law. My interest over these years um, has been in understanding the political and the legal dimensions of American milita military invention, intervention in Syria. So just to provide, so it can sound like a somewhat academic approach to take to this topic after some of these more passionate talks, but I would argue that the crisis has often been framed by all parties by reference to international law. Uh, so that's from Assad himself more recently has described US officials as easily trampling over international law, which is about our sovereignty now. Uh, and equally, Russia and the United States have made references to the other parties complying or not complying with international law. In addition, talking in these terms does engage key issues related to the political wisdom and morality of emerging doctrines of humanitarian intervention. So it means that I can engage with this topic. Something I won't be going into significantly, but I think is quite important to keep in mind, is I'm very aware that <clears throat> I am coming from a different perspective in the sense that I think, unlike the other speakers, I generally accept the arguments and the characterizations of what's going on in Syria from the mainstream media. And we can discuss this in the question and answer part if necessary. Um, as an academic and a citizen, um, I accept the findings of an independent media in most cases, uh, <clears throat> and especially where journalists have traveled to the region and reached their own conclusions. So it's not a practical solution so that each individual must go and look for themselves. That's the purpose of the media. So it's a much broader argument again, that the Australian or the international community shouldn't listen to the mainstream media. There's another debate which can be saved for later. Um, so some may likely disagree with the premise of some of my conclusions that I make. So the focus that I'll take, given the topic, is on the legal and the political assessment of American military intervention in Syria. So. I'm looking at the international law um, and the military entry. So, so when we look at international law in this particular area, looking at intervention and use of force, just a quick background is that uh, under international law, the basic principle is that the territorial integrity of all states is protected under international law, subject to some narrow exceptions, which are, first of all, that military force is authorized by the United Nations Security Council, with its five permanent members in particular, or secondly, that states can act in self-defense. And those are really the only two uh, situations where military force can be used. So applying that to the Syrian situation, I'll focus on three distinct examples of American military intervention in Syria, or potential military intervention, and assess the legal and the political dimension of that. So the first is the decision from at least 2012 uh, to directly train rebels within Syria fighting the Assad regime and the later decision to supply arms. The second is the debate that occurred between August and September 2013 about a possible military response to chemical weapons use in Syria. And then the third is the use of airstrikes against ISIS within the Syrian territory, which started from September 2014 and continues even to today. So looking at the first of those examples, that is training and arming fighters within Syria. So some of the facts of the situation is that uh, and particularly as admitted by the United States, is that from 2012, the US military set up regional supply lines to provide rebels with non-lethal assistance, including uniforms, radios, and medical aid. Uh, CIA operatives and US Special Operations troops at that time were also secretly training Syrian rebels with anti-tank and aircraft weapons. Uh, there was an admission that there were covert US training bases in Jordan and Turkey, for instance. Uh, the CIA was in particular was involved in facilitating the supply of arms, including automatic rifles, rocket propelled grenades, ammunition, some anti-tank weapons, etc., particularly through Syria's Muslim Brotherhood, as paid for by Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. So these facts were all established. Um, Obama's decision then in mid-2013 was to specifically supply arms and ammunition to the rebels. So this had been done perhaps more indirectly through the CIA before that, but from mid-2013, it became official US policy to provide arms to rebels following a determination at that point, which I'll get to later, about Assad using chemical weapons against civilians. So my first brief legal assessment of this situation is that the CIA secret training programs were done co covertly, and this was admitted by members of the CIA, in part due to US legal concerns about publicly arming the rebels. Uh, because that would constitute an act of war against the Assad government, potentially. Uh, and so that was recognized at the time. Uh, the basic law governing this situation 
was set out in the 1986 case of Nicaragua against the United States before the International Court of Justice. So I know many of you will be familiar with this history, but the US created, funded, and assisted um, the Contras, who were a re rebel group in Nicaragua trying to overthrow the Sandinista government. Uh, the US actions there also included training, arming, and funding the Contras. Um, and the in International Court of Just held, Justice held in that case that, quote, assistance to rebels in the form of the provision of weapons or logistical and other support may be a use of force, contrary to international law. So it is a pretty good argument that the United States uh, arming uh, rebels within Syria um, is contrary to its international legal obligations. In terms of the political assessment of the situation, um, it's always been a fraught argument that the United States has been putting forward in terms of what it's trying to achieve in Syria. And there is an implausibility, of course, to arming what has been referred to as the moderate Syrian opposition. So Hillary Clinton in 2014 was the secretary, after she left the position of Secretary of State, um, was long pushed for the arming of rebels from a very early point in the conflict. Uh, and so she said in 2014, uh, the failure to help build up a credible fighting force of the people who were the originators of the protests against Assad, there were Islamists, there were secularists, there was everything in the middle. The failure to do that left a big vacuum which the jihadists have now filled. This position was always opposed by Barack Obama, according to all of the evidence, um, who has been much more resistant about getting involved. And so he said, when you have a professional army, referring to um, Assad's army or the Syrian army, uh, fighting against a farmer, a carpenter, an engineer who started out as protesters and suddenly now see themselves in the midst of a civil conflict. The notion that we could have in a clean way that didn't commit US military forces changed the equation on the ground that was, there was never true. So Obama was always wary about this idea that getting in early could have made a difference. Essentially the request was that this small group and some have estimated maybe probably less than 10% of the fighters on the ground might be genuine uh, opposition fighters wanting um, a secular government. Uh, no more than 10% were going to defeat Assad, then defeat ISIS, and establish an effective cohesive government at the end of all of that. There was always an implausible expectation. Um, and in, in addition, there's the problem of shifting alliances, and that's been mentioned uh, at least one of the talks um, was that, for instance, the United States, after providing some of this aid, then had to suspend shipments, for instance, in 2013 of non-lethal military aid uh, because uh, e equipment um, was seized by the Islamic Front as an offshoot of the American-backed Free Syrian Army, who the pre previous were being supplied by the United States. Uh, so the conclusion really is that in relation to the arming of uh, rebels within Syria is that the United States' actions are arguably illegal under international law and politically miscalculated um, in terms of re-establishing peace and security in Syria. Okay, so moving to the second example of uh, military intervention in Syria by the United States was the 2013 debate about a military response to chemical weapons use in Syria. So the facts there uh, were that Obama in 2012 famously said, we've been very clear to the Assad regime that a red line for us as we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilised. That would change my calculus. So there's not, there aren't many groups who disagree that chemical weapons were used in August of 2013 against civilians in Syria. There are questions, though, relating to um, who used them, essentially. So Assad denied committing those attacks. The Obama administration argued that they had clearly been used by Syrian forces. Uh, loaded with nerve gas, uh, that, that rockets loaded with nerve gas had been put into opposition controlled parts of Damascus. And the evidence uh, argued was that this, it included the means of delivery for, combined with the interceptor communications from the Syrian army preparing for the attacks were argued to be the evidence that the Assad regime and the military had used those weapons. Uh, looking extensively at the media commentary on this and some of the analysis, um, the best arguments, the best conclusion that can be reached is that the evidence is circumstantial in both ways. I think that there are serious questions that can be raised um, about the actions of the Syrian army at this point. The way, I think that there's weight of evidence that Assad's forces may have deployed these weapons uh, with or without his knowledge. Uh, uh, but the fact that it's circumstantial and no clear link has been shown either way becomes very important for applying the international law to the situation. 
Uh, the, uh, there's no clear evidence that Assad used these weapons, and there's no clear evidence that the rebels released them either as a political strategy, as has been claimed. So, uh, nevertheless, on, Ob on August the 31st, Obama announced that the United States should take military action against Syrian regime targets, uh, following the conclusion that they had been released by the Syrian army. I'm confident that we can hold the Assad regime accountable for their use of chemical weapons, deter this kind of behaviour and degrade the capacity to carry it out. However, it's notable that he made a second decision at that time um, to seek authorisation from Congress for the use of military force. Uh, that, that he, had to, he was going to seek authorisation from Congress, uh, which clearly indicated that Obama didn't have any intention of going into Syria at that point. No president since before the Korean War has said that they needed authorisation under the Constitution from the Congress. And knowing that this was going to be rebuffed, uh, suggested that Obama was trying to find a way out of going into Syria at this time. Um, there's no suggestion that this would have been a legal use of force if Syria had have intervened at this point um, under the United Nations uh, as there was no Security Council authorization and it certainly was an act of self-defense. However, this is where the question of humanitarian intervention is raised, which is the topic of this talk generally. Um, which is that there is this argument that's been put forward by the United States and the United Kingdom especially that there is a further exception to the prohibition on the use of force um, to, uh, where to protect another state's own nationals from falling victim to extreme cruelty or persecution. And this is the more technical use of the concept of humanitarian intervention. The preponderance of practice and commentary is that this is a, not a legal use of international uh, force and international affairs. And this is closely related to what Australians seem to be much more familiar with, this responsibility to protect doctrine, which was developed through Gareth Evans, our former foreign minister. Um, there was, however, much enthusiasm with the US State Department for intervening in Syria at this point, according to uh, the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. So Amory Slaughter, as the director of policy planning, um, argued strongly that uh, this was necessary. Um, more specifically, Harold Coe, um, who was uh, the legal advisor at the State Department through much of this period, argued that, I believe that international law has evolved sufficiently to permit morally legitimate, legitimate action to prevent atrocities by responding to the deliberate use of chemical weapons. He said that the constraints of existing international law should change to allow, facilitate this policy as they denied any nation, no matter how well in meaning, um, any lawful way to use even limited and multilateral force to prevent Assad from intentionally gassing a million Syri um, Syrian children tomorrow. I believe that under certain highly constrained circumstances, a nation could lawfully use or threaten force for genuinely humanitarian purposes, even absent authorization by UN Security Council resolution. So that was the argument that was being put forward in the State Department at the time. Notably, it's never been accepted formally by the United States, even in its Kosovo intervention through NATO in 1999, Policymakers have always been aware of the fact that because it's self-judging, the state who's using force has to make the decision whether their own actions are legal. It essentially means that any state could use it, which is why it's a highly problematic concept under international law. And despite being forcefully pushed, and will be pushed in the future, and Hillary Clinton may have some um, regard for the doctrine, uh, depending if she get, make, becomes president in the future, um, it nevertheless has never been accepted formally as part of American policy, but it clearly has structured policy and the particular approaches to engaging with other countries. Um, I'd argue that making a political assessment of the situation, um, absent incontrovertible proof um, that Assad released chemical weapons is fairly decisive here because it mirrors closely what happened in 2003 with the Iraq invasion, which was that there was this, a lot of evidence claimed to show that there were weapons of mass destruction, um, and it turned out there were none. Uh, the same error essentially will have, would have been made if the United States had have gone in in this case. How many minutes have I left? Sorry. One. So my third point is that um, the use of airstrikes against ISIS that continue until today. So even today there are up to five airstrikes um, near Al Haskar and Kobani by the United States. Um, the, here I do diverge somewhat in, in arguing that the United States has acted legally um, in uh, intervening militarily in this part of Syria. So Syri the Syrian Prime Minister has called this an act of aggression um, unless it's coordinated with Damascus. Um, the, Russia has called this a gross violation of international law. If I can summarise the argument very briefly for why I would argue that this is legal, um, is that essentially the fact is that the United States has been invited by Iraq to f defend against ISIS. The Islamic State is based in Syria with its nominal capital in Raqqa. Uh, the Assad regime has lost political control over that particular part of territory um, where Raqqa is. And so as an act of self-defence on behalf of Iraq, uh, 
the United States is going into just that area which um, is no longer controlled by the Assad regime. I would argue that under international law, and this is a doctrine that the United States has promoted for a long time but has never really been accepted more broadly, um, that it would be legal in those circumstances. But it does mean you can then hold the United States to account because if, if Iraq withdraws um, support or if there was any attempt to go beyond the areas that were controlled by ISIS to areas that were under Syrian government control, it would become illegal under international law. Um, my final um, conclusion to make um, is that perhaps the best evidence of the limits of humanitarian intervention is that um, there may be some disagreement perhaps on some of the facts on the ground of what's happening on this panel even. And that perhaps is evidence of why um, where the political facts are contested, as they always will be, and even the nature of justice is contested, then it's very difficult to make an intervention into a country um, without creating more disorder. Um, so essentially foreign policy, difficult foreign policy choices such as um, what's facing the, the United States is facing looking at Syria, is always a choice between a number of awful alternatives. And so it's really about choosing the least awful alternative, which itself will almost certainly still involve suffering. Um, and so, just as the last statement, I would argue that the pragmatic accommodation of Assad um, that seems to be emerging on the part of the United States is arguably a positive step. That it's clear that um, the United States essentially doesn't have to concern itself so much with the nature of the regime. It's clear that the Assad regime is the one most likely to be able to re-establish control in the region. It's really re-establishing government control that will be a step towards um, moving out of the violence of the last four years. Uh, however, uh, I would argue that Assad isn't part of the longer-term solution in Syria uh, for reasons which I can discuss in the question and answer session.